Well, welcome to the uh, January 2022 SJAA Imaging uh, Special Interest Group meeting. Uh, we got a, a special guest, our friend Francesco Mescia is going to tell us all about uh, processing. And um, without further ado, Francesco, take it away. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> Thank you very much to, for giving me this opportunity. To, to give not just one, but two talks. <laughs> so, and uh, as we were joking uh, <clears throat> before, before the start of this meeting, uh, tonight is gonna be processing clean data or relatively clean data. And then um, the next one will be processing garbage and trying to get out something <clears throat> out, of, out of garbage. So tonight, if you want, it's kind of an introduction, but not too much because of the, um, the, the processing of uh, the helping hand nebula, which is the, the target that I chose for this, is not challenging because of the quality of data, because we're taken from a nice dark place from Pinnacles National Park. So they don't have gradients to fight. Uh, they, not a big, uh, not many problems. They were all taken in the same night. There's nothing to equalize, but the object, the target is exceedingly faint. <clears throat> and to give you an idea of how faint it is, I'm going to start sharing and showing you some images. Uh, first of all, where it is? Where is this object? So if, uh, if on Sky Safari I search for helping hand, there is nothing. What you need to know to find this object is that it's next to a variable star in, uh, in Cassiopeia. SUCAS. SU Cassiopeia, it is actually listed in, uh, in Sky Safari, but it's just uh, listed as a star. And so, how do we know that there's something there? Well, I know because I found this object imaged by somebody else on uh, Astrobin. So, let me switch to <clears throat> Astrobin and show you. Astrobin. Here we are. So I had found this <clears throat> some time ago, and it's still in my in my favorites in uh, in Pixin size. Let's see if I can quickly find it. Bookmarks. And it was a few years ago, so we need to go back in time. And it, was, uh, it wasn't immediately clear to me that it was uh, that faint. And so I tried to image it last year and I wasn't, uh, I, of course I cannot find it now. I wasn't uh, really equipped for that. I was just using my DSLR and there was essentially nothing. It was a very, a very, very faint change in the, the color of the background. It was a very hard, even for me to say if I was a, if I had a really frame, I, oh, here it is. This is the first, uh, it's actually, I like it so much that it's my very first uh, bookmark in, uh, in Astrobin. So this was the, the image that got me hooked here. But where is it? So I said that it's the SU Cassiopeia, it's between Cassiopeia and uh, the constellation of uh, Camelopardalis, the giraffe. So, I tried to figure out where it is by looking, I found this very nice wide field image of Cassiopeia to see where it is. And uh, I know where it is, so I'm gonna show you, but I don't see it in this, even in this image, which is uh, relatively deep. I mean, uh, you can see the Pac-Man Nebula here. You can see the Soul Nebula, the Heart Nebula, the Hubble Cluster. You can see a number of dark nebulae in uh, in the Milky Way, but let me zoom in. This one is SU Cassiopeia. And the SU Cassiopeia is exactly where the, the forward hand is, so to speak. And I don't see absolutely anything in terms of nebulae around here. If I, instead of using a, 
uh, amateur images I go to a professional catalog, I can uh, try to show you something more. Let me get this one, which is uh, the Aladdin catalog. So if I go in the in the area where I have uh, where this image is, and I and I show you with the uh, the standard the DSS, the, 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 the digital sky survey from uh, Mount Palomar, using the, the color rendition, I see almost nothing. I can actually see a very faint reflection nebula. But if you want to see something, you have to either invert this palette like, like this. And in this way, you can start making out that this area here is a whiter and it being a, a negative it means that it's darker or you can use a, a color palette like this one that makes it somewhat easier to read you see here there's a this is the shoulder this is the arm and this is the hand but it's it's rotated 90 degrees compared to my image because of i had rotated my camera but it's very very hard so to produce my image, I went, uh, <clears throat> this was from Pinnacles National Park, Pinnacles West. It's uh, eight hours and 30 minutes of total integration. Uh, of course, combining the R, G, and B channels. That night, uh, my SQM meter was uh, measuring 21.30 magnitudes per square hour second. So not one of the very darkest nights at Pinnacles, but fairly good one. I mean, you know, in a, the best I've seen at Pinnacles is a 21.75. This was not at that level, but it was fairly decent. So it was challenging. And uh, when I when I processed, when I pre-processed my data and I obtained the three master files that I shared with you, I wasn't particularly happy to see that because the, those images were grainy, those images were noisy. So let me just open those, those images right now so we can talk about that. Uh, let's see. This is the red color, red filter. This is blue. Yeah, we're seeing the astro bin. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Let me do it. Fix inside. I apologize. Yeah. Right. So this is R. Uh, something is visible. In blue, the dark, the dark nebula are more visible. Let's bring in the green as well. And this is green, which is uh, almost halfway between the two. So if I zoom in, there's lots of noise. This, uh, this, which means that uh, these are all three images have a STF, auto STF applied. So Pix Insight screen scratches them, stretches them so that you they are visible. But it means that this nebula are very, very close to the <coughs> brightness of the background sky. There is no contrast essentially. So the the motive of this uh, of this processing would be how to keep uh, how to make the image readable while keeping the noise at bay without uh, magnifying, amplifying the noise too much. So there is one thing that I like to do when I, that I learned to do when I switched to a mono camera. There is a, a very useful uh, script in PixInsight that needs to be used uh, only, it can only be used uh, with mono images and needs to be used as uh, basically the first process that you're ever gonna do to the to the master data, which is the Muir denoise script, and it's uh, under uh, Glenn. Can you? Uh, sorry, hi. Can, do you see my menus when I pull down the menus right now? I have a menu pulled out. Yes. Okay. Perfect. We don't see the full menu. We see part of it. The uh, only part. Yeah. Right. Let's try like this. Can you see all of it now? Yeah. Okay. So. Mirror the noise is a, is a very powerful script and it does a very good job at uh, reducing noise, but can only be used with um, 
with mono images and you need to have a characterized your sensor because you have to feed the, the script with the informations that are the, the gain of your sensor in uh, electrons per dn, the, the noise content of your image in, um, strangely enough, measured in dn rather than in electrons, but it's just a, it's just a conversion. There is a companion script that you can use, this one, Muir noise, sorry, Muir denoise detector, detector settings that helps you uh, determine those values if you don't uh, if you don't trust the ones that the, the manufacturer has given you, and uh, it's easy to use. You just needed to have some calibration file like two biases, two darks, and two flats to for for the script to analyze. Now I'm going to run the script. I have to run it on all three masters. It's going to take a little bit of time, so I apologize. I'm going to start. This is not a very powerful machine, so it's take, it takes a little bit. In the meantime, I mentioned earlier that I was going to get some reference material. So if you are interested, um, these are a couple of books that I recommend about uh, PixInsight. This one is, uh, oops, let's put some light. This one is uh, the first edition of uh, Warren Keller's uh, Inside uh, PixInsight. Francesco, maybe unshare uh, and yeah. so we can see you bigger. All right. All right. So this is the, the first version of the first edition of um, in, Inside the Pix Insight by Warren Keller. It's a um, it's a good um, it's a good doc, good reference for uh, both uh, OSC and uh, mono camera, and has uh, some good examples of workflows also for RGB images and uh, for uh, narrowband imaging too. Then more recently. I have become acquainted with this one, which is Rogelio's uh, Master in Pix Insight. That is, um, well, let's say it's different because uh, Warren and uh, Rogelio have different approaches to, to processing the data, but it's, <clears throat> it's just as useful as, uh, as the previous one, as Inside Pix Insight. Actually, as a bonus, Rogelio also has produced the a second volume is not a second edition; is a companion volume, which is the reference guide for all the processes and for the most important scripts in the PixInsight. And it's, uh, I think, Rogelio has run out of printed copies, but he still has uh, the, the electronic version is still available. So I don't want to, I don't want to give free advertising to him, but it, it's it's good work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Francesco, just a note about the mute the noise for the user uh, like me of the 1600. Uh, those data number are number in 64,000 uh, range, in the 16 bit range. Yes. So you have to multiply your number by, by, by 16, otherwise, uh, mute the noise is not working. Yes, because uh, thank you for uh, for mentioning that uh, I have a 14 bit camera and uh, other people, people who have the 1600, that's a 12 bit camera, but it's um, PixInsight always rescales your the the gray space of your uh, of your camera to a 16 bit space. And so, yes, there is always this uh, uh, this multiplication that needs to be done if you want to trans to transform the data that the manufacturer gives you, which is typically in the native bit space of the camera to the pixel inside plan. But the companion script works, right? You just yeah, it works. All right. So pixel inside is just the mirror the noise has just finished the processing the first one. So let me share it with you before I move to the next one. There is a question on the chat for you, Francisco. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me see how I get to the chat. Here it is. Oh, the yes, uh, somebody already replied. The the second book is Mastering Pix Insight by Rogelio Bernal Andreo. Yes, this one. I'll I'll put Rogelio's full name on the chat. Yeah, and you please put also he has a website, deepskycolors.com. Okay. All right, so let me show you the effect of this uh, script. Now the script is executed right now. 
I am going to undo and redo. As usual, via Zoom, I never know how good is the, is the rendering of uh, fine details use, uh, with the Zoom video protocol. So please, uh, uh, Paolo, Glenn, hi, let me know how is, if what I'm showing is visible at all. So I'm undoing, it's undone, and redoing. Undo, redo. It's, it's visible. Yeah, okay, I can see it. So you can see that the noise is significantly reduced, at least the, the small scale noise. We can also get uh, a more, uh, an even more qualitative approach, but if I take the histogram transformation window and uh, I, zoom, I enlarge this, the X scale, look what happens to the distribution of the histogram when I undo and redo. You see, it gets that much narrower, like uh, half as narrow when I, when I do this, uh, this script. So this is gonna, it's what I like to, it's a script that I like to use, because, not only because it's effective, but because it, it doesn't guess what are the, the, the data that are important and what are the data that are not important. It tries to, want to figure out what is the noise distribution based on the characteristic of the sensor. And it's, it's trying multiple, uh, doing multiple attempts and finding the magnitude of uh, the denoising to, to introduce that minimizes uh, the um, minimizing the the output sigma without uh, sacrificing the detail. It's I use it in lieu of a TGV denoise essentially. Now we've done it for uh, R. Let's do it for the other two channels. So I apologize. It's going to take uh, again a little bit. Let's do it on the blue channel. Fortunately, the camera is the same, so the gain and noise are the same uh, in uh, red, green, and blue. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a bummer that it doesn't work uh, on with OSC cameras. Or rather, there is a way to make it work, but you have to debayer your uh, your image uh, in um, using the uh, what's called uh, the super pixel debayer algorithm which is basically sacrificing uh, making a uh, four pixel makes one. The advantage uh, that it doesn't, that it doesn't have any interpolation, which, and the interpolation is exactly what makes it uh, um, mirror denoise unsuitable for, um, for OSC data. If you, if you give up resolution, you get uh, good results, uh, even in OSC by separating the, the channels and uh, applying uh, um, this uh, script to each of the, of the channels, but you have to analyze uh, separately the noise values and the gain values for the three colors because a green in a, you know in an OST camera is not one channel but is the combination of two channels, green one and green two. Oops, I see that Rogelio is here. Sorry, Rogelio, I was being your PR agent. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So I'm. Uh, we are waiting for uh, <clears throat> for the second mirror the noise to finish. Let's see. It's um, you can actually like many scripts in uh, and the uh, denoise uh, techniques in PixInsight. You can decide how many iterations. Uh, need to um, are subsequently applied to the image. In this case, I, I, I used the eight, which uh, seems to work for uh, for my for the type of noise that I get from my camera. But of course, it's uh, it's worth experimenting if with your own cameras. Uh, let's see, almost there. The iterations are called the cycle spin in uh, in the script. You can also use it on the uncut to the calibrated and registered images before integrating. But of course, uh, you, you're seeing how, how slow it is. Think about doing this for 100 uh, subs before integration. It's, you need a, a very fast machine for a lot of patients. Okay, blue is done. I am going to apply it to green as well. Suraj wants to know if you can run your denoise with Drizzle data. 
I doubt that you can because uh, that changes, uh, that is, it is an interpolation and uh, it's probably not, uh, you cannot, I don't think you can predict uh, how much is gonna exactly interpolate its channel, but maybe in that case, I would do it before, uh, and before it doing the drizzle integrate. So I would uh, use mirror the noise uh, on the calibrated subs. And so I, it's gonna take a long time. All right. And we are almost halfway through. And I, I apologize, I don't, uh, I have um, several windows uh, hiding the, the chat. So if there's a question, I, could I ask you to, to say it loud? Yeah, I uh, Nick uh, suggested I do that. There, so no, I, I apologize. It was Bruce, but anyway, yes, I'll do it. But if I miss it, please, anybody else who notices, please uh, speak up. Yeah, thanks. So this is one of the slowest process. It's not a process of the script, but it's the one of the slowest step in the workflow. So bear with me, and we'll get there. So while we're waiting, was your pre-processing straightforward? Just uh... oh yeah, it's uh, as straightforward as it gets. I use the WBPP, which is a thing that people tell you not to do, but it's uh, it, in this case I would say that there were uh, extenuating circumstances. The the images were collected under good skies. So the, the there was almost no variation in gradients. Uh, it's not like I had to to do a big selection or uh, <clears throat> some strange normalization. I didn't even use uh, the normalized scale gradient script, which is very useful, but it's uh, it was kind of overkill in this case. So yeah, it's uh, the three scripts that you get, uh, as you may have guessed from the five names, are the ones that uh, WBVP outputs directly after, after calibrating, registering, or integrating the the images and I think that for um, as normalizing factor I use the the um, signal to noise estimate estimation the one that uh, picks inside doesn't turn all right we're done we have uh, successfully denoised the the three masters R G and B look at how effective it is in in blue undo redo undo redo it's really good and in green as well. Uh, go slow with the undo, redo. All right, I'll, I'll go slower. Undo. I couldn't really see it. Redo. Undo. Redo. That looks quite apparent to me. Okay. And uh, we can also look at it with the, with the help of the histogram. Undo. Redo. Takes away almost a half of the width of the histogram, so not bad. By the way, we were mentioning uh, this, the the reference star for this object, SU Cassiopeia, is this star here. So, if you recall uh, what I was showing you in that astrobin image, uh, you should have seen this uh, this dark uh, section here, and maybe this one, and I could absolutely see nothing in that uh, uh, in that image, which was not a bad image at all. So it's, it is faint. All right, so now we have the three masters and we have uh, done a first, uh, first run of, uh, of denoising. What I normally do at this point is uh, to apply a little bit of uh, cropping with uh, using the dynamic crop uh, process. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, the edges, given that I, I dithered during, um, during capture, the edges have only partial covering. There's only partial overlap of the images in the stack in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in each of the masters. So I normally crop a little bit. So this camera has natively uh, 4144 pixels by 2822 pixels, and I like to crop it to 4000 by 2700. 
and this is it. The other thing at this point, once I've done it for one image, I go into the history explorer and I just drag and drop the process onto the other two images. So I am mathematically sure that they are cropped in exactly the same way. There's no difference. The other thing that at this point I like to do is, uh, and again, this is just my way of doing things. There are, there are other ways. I like to try to do an initial modeling of the background. And uh, in this case, what I do is uh, simply to use uh, the automatic background uh, extractor. And I don't want to model closely the, um, the actual target, so the helping hand nebula. I just want to model the overall brightness. So what I do is to use a, a low uh, polynomial degree for interpolation. Instead of the default four, I use a, a function degree two, so it's going to be a parabola. And uh, I like to normalize so that it doesn't actually change the overall brightness because I'm going to take care of that with linear fit later. And uh, let's try to apply it first to this one. Now, this, this script, uh, I set it to, to produce uh, uh, as a secondary output the map of the background that was applied. So if I do an auto STF here, I can see that this is uh, the background uh, that was subtracted from this image. It doesn't have uh, any sign uh, of having the object itself in it, so I'm okay. I can uh, adjust the throw it away. And I am gonna also drag uh, this, drag and drop this process on the other two masters. And again, I inspect the background, still pretty good. It's basically some residual vignette vignetting. Uh, Francesco, question. Yep. This is Rich. Does this uh, script magically detect and subtract the nebula from the background? Um, it depends. If you, it, the script is essentially is trying to, uh, to interpolate uh, your bright, the brightness of this image with, um, with a polynomial function. If you increase enough the, the degree of the polynomial, so if you put it like a, a 16th degree or a, maybe even 10th degree, it's gonna model closer and closer to the actual brightness. So it, it is gonna start modeling the nebula itself, which is what you don't want. Right. What you want is to limit the, Not to use a low degree for the polynomial so that it just uh, takes a general, compensate for a gen, for the general, uh, uh, <clears throat> not an average, but the, the low, the, the um, very large scale brightness of your image. I understand. I understand. You can even use a zero, in which case it's just gonna subtract the pedestal, or one, which is essentially assumes a linear ramp. Right. In this case, it's, we assume the parabolic ramp. And we did it for all three images. So this is uh, the, these are the three results. Of course, they look like they have a similar brightness values here, but it's just because we have applied ABE on, uh, uh, sorry, we have applied the uh, SDF to all three. It doesn't actually mean that the three images have, a, have comparable brightness values. Right now, I just reapplied uh, um, the auto SDF and you can see the, the brightness level changed and we don't know if they are compatible. So what I do at this point is to use the linear, the linear fit script to fit the, I would say two channels to the one that has the best uh, signal to noise ratio. In this case, I think I estimated that red is the one that I would fit to. So I take this script, color spaces, uh, sorry, color calibration, linear fit, and I'm just gonna need to indicate what is the reference image. And at that point, I can drag and drop it onto green. Oh, sorry, I should rename the, the images. Instead of using these long names, I'm just gonna call it R, G, and B, just by double clicking on the tab and entering the new name. 
Now, R is actually a name of, a, of an image, so it's not going to complain. And yeah, it's fitting right now. As you can see, the, the brightness value has changed. And in, I need to do a new auto STF to bring it back. I'm going to do the same here. Once this is done, the three images have been fitted to each other. What this means is that if I look at the levels with the histogram, and I, I look at R and G, sorry, and G and B, you see the histogram almost does not change. It means that the median values of the three images have been brought uh, to coincide more or less, which means that when we combine them together to produce an RGB image, which is my next step, I'm not going to have a, a completely red image or a completely green image or a completely blue image because they are more or less balanced with each other. They're not yet calibrated in colors, <clears throat> but it's a, uh, it's a good start, I would say. So let's do this without further ado. We take uh, the channel combination script uh, process, and I'm going to tell PixInsight that I want to use uh, the image called R as a red channel, the image called G as a green channel, and this one B as a blue channel. And then I'm going to have to check that I selected the RGB color space. And instead of using a drag and drop or using the apply icon, I'm going to use the apply global icon because I want the output not to be applied to one particular target, but to be created as another first class citizens of, citizen of the PixInsight space. So in the global context, uh, in the PixInsight jargon. So here it is. Of course, this is a linear image still, and we have no STF applied yet. So I'm going to apply STF now. So command A on my Mac. And this is the first time that we see some color here. So <clears throat> I remember, I think I remember that what I, what I did when I first looked at this image, I noticed that there was some unevenness in color. There was some green here, some green here. So I thought that maybe it was, uh, it could be worth another run of uh, ABE, automatic background extraction with the same parameters as before, because maybe there was something left over from uh, the previous run. And this is it. And this is the result. Not much did change actually. I I could have I could have avoided it. Not a big deal. Now we have to the the following step in my workflow when I'm when I'm at this point is to do an initial calibration of colors while we are still in the linear phase. Um, most uh, why am I, am I doing this? It's because most of the tools in um, in PixInsight operate uh, on a, most of the color calibration tools operate best uh, when they are uh, in um, in the linear space so that when you add or uh, remove or subtract values like a background you can actually do it because you are still in the linear space once you have stretched the subtraction or additions are no longer subtraction or addition you should do a more complicated uh, operation of probably multiplication or even uh, exponentiation. So I like to do it while uh, we are still uh, linear. And the first thing I do here, there are essentially two, two main workflows that I, I follow depending on the image. Either I do photometric color calibration or I do <clears throat> the standard color calibration, uh, which is this tool here. Now, what is the difference between the two? It, when I use uh, the color calibration tool, I have to inst instruct the tool with some uh, parameters to not, not consider the background, not consider the nebula themselves, not consider the saturated stars that are by definition white, but consider the, all of the, the union, so to speak, of all the stars in this uh, in this image, 
and uh, rescale their values with the assumption that uh, the um, the combination of all this uh, of all these colors, all the colors of these stars, is a, a pure white. <clears throat> and uh, this is a uh, I'm uh, answering also in this way, and one of the questions on the chat. This is the way that you do that you can do color calibration in um, in an RGB image. For narrowband, uh, <clears throat> this uh, most of the narrowband uh, processing that I do uses some form of tone mapping or uh, the, the dynamic uh, palette combination that uh, Paolo was also mentioning. So there is no, not really, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to talk about color calibration in, in because the palette is essentially chosen by you when you, when you do narrowband imaging. But in this case, I'd like to, <clears throat> what I'd like to have is a, a balanced color of the stars given that this image as nice uh, bright beacons you see here as UKCP, this I think is RZ KCP, and then there's a number of, a number of other stars. I wanted to <clears throat> them to be to show me a nice spectrum of colors. So I want to have some blue stars, I want to have some orange stars and yellow stars. So I have tried uh, to use both PCC, both photometric color calibration, and the standard color calibration in this image, and found that I prefer the color calibration. And this is not science. This is purely my aesthetic sense. It has nothing to, nothing to do with what is the right way to do it, provided that there is a right way. The PCC has uh, its own, uh, has its merit, absolutely. Uh, what it does is to compare these uh, images with uh, this image, the content, uh, the, the chromatic content of this image with the chromatic contents of uh, the, this, the stars taken from a catalog. And so what, they, what it does is uh, after that, it tries to uh, color white balance your image in um, compared to either a spectral class uh, of stars or an average type of galaxy. So you can tweak the way that PCC works considerably choosing a different reference, of course. In this case, as I said, my aesthetic sense and uh, my, what I meant uh, to communicate with this image uh, was uh, more suitable to, um, to, the, to the standard color calibration workflow. But before doing the color calibration in this way, I want to tackle another challenge, which is uh, to neutralize the background. As you can see, the background has some colors. There's dust here. And the dust has colors because it reflects the light of stars. And the stars are different colors. So what I normally do is to try to guess what could be a relatively neutral part of the background. And I believe that in this case, I consider that this area here, I don't see many. I see that there's a, a whiff of dust here. There's some dust here. There's obviously dust here. But this area here could uh, is plausibly part of the background, at least part of the background for the depth that I went to. So I create a preview in this area, and I'm gonna use this preview as my reference um, black, so to speak, reference black background actually, not black. So at this point, what I do is to use the neutralization, uh, background neutralization tool, which I have here in my, in my palette, but it's also available here under color calibration, background neutralization, you have to indicate what is uh, the reference image, which is in this case is, is image 07, so the target one. And I want to indicate the region of interest, which I'm gonna inherit from the preview. Why do I do a reference, uh, a region of interest instead of just choosing a preview here? Well, it's a matter of habit. It's um, when you do this, um, if you have multiple images that you want to apply the same process to, and this image have maybe they don't have a preview created in each of them, you may want to use uh, the as the target the image that, where you want to apply the process and uh, copy the the coordinates of the region of interest instead of creating and previews one per each of the images that you want. 
The other thing that you need to do is to tell the script what is that you consider the upper limit for search in the background. And this is one of those cases in which the default is not right, because this is a still a linear image. So we have to go and measure what is the average background here. And the way I do it, there are many ways, but the way I like to do it, I take the histogram transformation tool, I enlarge this scale suitably, the horizontal scale, I choose my preview, and then I'm gonna look for, you know, here you are. So you see, this is the where the histogram lies for this, uh, uh, this image. I want to make sure that the script is only gonna consider pixels that whose values fall in this in this curve. And so I'm gonna set as top limit the value that I read here, which you see where you, we have here X equals 0 0.0007. I'm gonna use that one or maybe 008 as my upper limit for this tool. So let me, let me put it in and show you the result. So I'm going to say that upper limit is 0 0.0008. The lower limit can be left at zero, of course, because the, there are no negative values in, uh, in PixInsight. And the, the, the histogram of this image was pretty against the, the left edge. So I am going to drag and drop this. And the PixInsight has neutralized the, the uh, my my background in this preview as not actually has neutralized the, the entire image, but using as a reference this preview. What does it actually mean? Well, if I take the histogram again, and let me magnify as much as I can this uh, curve. This curve is actually the combination of a, a red curve, a green curve, and a blue curve. Before we I had applied this uh, neutralization. This was the result of the red, green, and blue. So if you look at the, this curve, you see that there is a little bit of a, there's more red towards the low values and more blue towards the high values. After I apply this background neutralization, it's essentially the situation is neutralized or even a little bit reversed. And uh, you can see it in the, in the, in the shape of, I don't know if it's uh, visible via zoom, but now we have the blue curve is uh, to the left and the red curve is to the right. What does it mean? It means that most of the background of this image has become slightly red, which kind of makes sense given that it is a faint dust illuminated by, uh, by stars and probably emitting uh, what they call uh, the ERE, the enhanced red emissions. Is there any question that I skipped? I apologize. Uh, okay, yes. All right, so now we have uh, applied the background neutralization. We haven't done any calibration yet. For calibration, I said I'm gonna use this tool. The reference image will be the target image. I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm gonna apply I don't want to use any particular region of interest. I want to use all the stars in this image, but I want uh, this image, this tool to extract and avoid considering uh, the nebula. And so to use the, in the jargon of this tool, I have to enable structure detection, structure detection so that the structures will be considered and removed from uh, the sample of the stars. So the, the, the level of, uh, <clears throat> of the brightness of the stars will be uh, will we'll receive a subtraction, and the subtraction will consider this, the first five layers of, uh, of structure. And maybe I should probably bring it up to six or seven, given that these are large scale nebulae. For uh, background, I can again indicate that I want to reuse that re the region of interest that I had already selected. There's one more thing that I need to do. I need to make sure that I'm not choosing, I'm telling this tool that I don't want to consider saturation, saturated stars. And I have to sample the, lab, the saturation level. How do I do that? Well, temporarily, I remove the auto SDF. Then I zoom in on a saturated star like this one. Now, 
and I sample the color of the saturated star. In this case, telling me that this saturated star does, is not really a, a pure white, has a green and blue have uh, reached the, the saturation at 1.0, whereas red is a tiny bit before saturation. It's a 0 0.966. So this is the this means two things. First of all, that I'm using effectively the color space or the gray space of, uh, of my camera because I have some saturated stars and I, I don't want to, to get all of the, the saturation to influence my calibration. So instead of going to 0 0.95, I'm going to stop at 0 0.9 or even 0 0.85. Like uh, you, you can decide. You know that 9, 0 0.99 is already saturated. Anything less than that it's probably still in the linear space. I prefer to keep myself a little lower. Now, let me put back the auto STF function and apply this tool. Great, now we are ready. It's calculating and calibrating. And this is the calibrated image according to the color calibration tool. So it's essentially in uh, considering uh, the average color of all the stars in uh, in this image and assuming that that should be white and again if your if your aesthetic taste uh, is uh, is different and you prefer to have uh, like more red stars or more blue stars you can at this point introduce your uh, your favorite color cast by using another tool which is this one the assisted color calibration which is very easy. You can, uh, okay, I want more blue in this image. So let's say that I want 10% more blue, 1.1. And here it is, it has become blue. And you can, you can adjust this uh, when, until your uh, aesthetic sense is satisfied. I'm gonna go back to my original attempt. All right. So now we have an image which is color calibrated and uh, has received an initial round of denoise, if you remember, but there's still a ton of noise, both chromatic noise and the large scale noise. So the following, the next step for me is uh, to do a, a round of a <clears throat> linear uh, noise reduction. Uh, it's, it's by no means the only way to do it. It's just the way I do it. And there are many tools to do it. Uh, one of the a very effective one that many people use and have used recently is the denoise, the easy denoise script that is part of the easy processing suite. And it's very good, it's valid, I'm, uh, I'm, not, uh, <clears throat> I'm not discounting it. I hope you don't mind if I show you the way I do it because I'd like to, to show one tool which is very useful for uh, linear noise action, which is the MMT tool or the medium, the multi-scale median transform. And I'm gonna try to show how, how I use it, meaning that how to make sense of all the parameters that you can uh, uh, set in this tool. There are quite a few. Now there are different ways to apply, <coughs> to use uh, these uh, denoising tools. I remember for instance, some people prefer to do uh, denoise uh, after stretching. I prefer to do it before stretching. That's a matter of essentially taste and essentially what you find the most effective for your image and your imaging style. It's, neither of the two is the, the right way to do it. Uh, most of the denoising processes require some form of a mask to be applied because uh, noise affects uh, disproportionately the low signal areas. It's in the low signal areas, in the, in the blacks, in the darks, in the shadows, that you have lots of noise, not in the bright signal area. So a typical mask that you can use is uh, an inverted luminance mask. An inverted luminance mask is almost transparent where, there is, um, where there's, there's low signal and it's almost opaque, so it doesn't let the operation go through in high signal area. How do I obtain a, um, an inverted luminance image? Well, I extract the luminance from this one and then I apply it as a mask after inverting it. 
Now, if it, it is tempting to just go to this button, which is the extraction of the CIE L star component, luminance, and just use it. But there's a problem here. Before we do that, we have to make sure that the three channels of this image, red, green, and blue, are equally weighted by, the, by this tool. Because the um, building a luminance it is essentially an operation that depends on how much you weigh the red component, the green component, and the blue component. By default, PixInsight uses the weights that are attributed to, this, um, uh, to the three components by the sRGB standards. And if you use the um, color space, uh, RGB working space, actually, the name of the tool, if you look at the RGB working space tool, these are the three weights, the coefficient that are by default applied to the, um, to the three channels. So it's about, we have a green, which is, uh, takes the line of share, 71% of the final result is from green. Red accounts for 22% of the final result, and blue accounts for 6% of the final result. Now, for astronomy, these weights don't make a lot of sense, because uh, as we all know, there's very green in the, in the sky. There are no green stars, because there's no green uh, black body spectrum. So the way that we, that I recommend that other authors rec recommended that I learn from them to obtain a good uh, representation of the luminance is to put these three coefficients to one, which means that actually means that each of them would be 0 0.333 because they are all normalized to one, of course. So I apply this to this process to the image. The image doesn't change. Nothing has changed in the image, it's just that all of the operations that transform from RGB to the uh, C LED space, we consider these co coefficients. At this point, I can extract the luminance with this button. And of course, it's a linear image, so I have to apply STF to see something. But instead of applying STF, I am going to permanently stretch this image so that it I can use it from that point onwards as a, a mask. And the way I do this is with a tool, but there's a, it's just because the tool is very convenient, I use this uh, uh, delinear tool, which just in one click does the job. But the, the way to do it manually is to open the histogram transformation and open side by side the auto STF, the screen transfer function tool, use the nuclear option to, um, to obtain the, the right uh, STF function, drag it and drop it over the histogram transformation, and finally apply the histogram transformation to your image. Your image will become all white because uh, you have to deactivate the auto STF. And the you have here is uh, finally a permanently stretched luminance image that you can use as a mask. You can tell that it's permanently stretched because it doesn't have the green for the reason. You can see it, and it doesn't have the green underlining that you have in, in all images for, that are subject to an auto SDF. So this is a good mask. So let me rename it as RGB mask. Oh, RGB, RGB L instead. And then I, I apply it as a mask. The way you do it, is just by tearing off this tab and dragging it next to the other preview tabs in, uh, in the target image. The image has become, has become red because uh, red is uh, the, the color that in my particular installation of PixInsight I have assigned to render the mask simulation. Now, any, anywhere you see green, it means that the mask protects the background. Anywhere you don't see green, it means that the mask is affecting what's, what's behind. And so you can see that it's, it's doing exactly the opposite of what we would like. It's protecting the background and not protecting the star. It's the opposite of what we want. So I go back into the mask menu and I invert the mask. Now it's doing what I want. The maximum 
effect of my denoising will be felt by these low signal areas, and uh, the stars will be left, left to be virtually untouched. All right, but now we have to do the actual denoising. How do we do that? So first of all, I don't like to see this mask, so I'm going to disable the show mask option. So I see this. I, I go back to seeing a regular RGB image. And I'm going to create a pre some previews for part of the image that I find interesting and on which I would like to judge uh, the effectiveness of my denoising. So let's, yeah, these two should be fine. Then I select one of the two. And finally, I'm going to open my chosen tool for. Uh, uh, for denoising, which is uh, the multi-scale medium transfer tool. Now, multi-scale linear transfer or uh, MMT is a uh, is a wavelet-based ba tool, or rather than uh, it's not really wavelet; it's multi-scale. So it operates in different ways at different scale. What is the meaning of scale in this context? Well, it means essentially the size of uh, it separates your image using uh, diff components uh, of at different scales, at different sizes. So the scale one means uh, variations, pixel to pixel variation, very minute variation. Scale two uh, means uh, variations from uh, a, a pair of pixels to the next pair of pixels. Scale four, it means from one block of four pixels to the next. And then eight and sixteen. There are, you know, there are powers of two, as you can see. So, and you can decide what how many you want to consider up to eight. So you can have as objects up to the scale of two hundred and fifty six pixels. Sorry, one hundred and twenty eight pixels, and then everything else will be part of what's called the residual. Um, for this image, I think I'm gonna be happy with the six layers. Not much. Um, you can apply this tool to the lightness, luminance, chrominance, or the RGB components. Now, in this case, given that I have both uh, uh, lumen, I have noise in all three channels, I prefer to apply to the RGB and, uh, components. The real trick in using this tool is to know how much to put, how much noise action is needed at each of the levels. How do I decide that? Well, First, I'm going to tell you what, it, what these parameters mean. So this parameter means start applying noise reduction to anything that exceeds a certain, sorry, that is below a certain threshold. And the threshold is measured in uh, units of, uh, of, stand, of sigma, of standard deviation of uh, your image at that, observed at that scale. So, I, if I want to have very aggressive noise reduction, I want this to parameter to be very large. Like I can set it to 10, which I believe is the value for that John Rista's um, articles use for the very low uh, small scale layers. It means that anything that does not protrude by at least 10 times, 10 standard deviations from the average will be cut down, will be reduced, will be, um, will be subject to noise reduction in a sense. And then there are two parameters up by how much. So you can have 1.0 is the maximum noise reduction, and you can go down to zero if you want. And adaptive is a way to, um, essentially, if you have a situations in which uh, you have a, a relatively well-behaved noise that doesn't maybe require a super high threshold, but you have some outliers, and you don't want to increase too much uh, the, the, the threshold because otherwise your image will, will look artificially flat and smooth, but you still want to take care of the outliers, you can uh, start increasing these adaptive parameters parameter to maybe one. I, don't, I normally don't use more than one, and it's very effective in catching the outliers. But how do you know that you have outliers? And how do you know how many units of sigma you want to reduce? Well, there is a trick for this uh, tool and not many people use it uh, to my knowledge. Let me show you what it is. 
uh, it's in this menu here. If I choose all changes and then I apply this uh, tool to, I'm gonna drop this, uh, this process into my preview. It's gonna show me in the preview the, the way that this tool sees my image in the scale that I'm, they have currently, uh, in the layer that I'm currently selected. So in this case, it's gonna show me what my image looks like if I only look at the very minute one pixel scale um, variations. Let's do it. The first time I execute it takes a little bit, so uh, bear with me for a moment. And of course, it needs to do it three times because of R, G, and B. But the following in run will be faster. All right. You, you see a nice white screen and say, okay, something went wrong. Actually, it did not go wrong, but again, we are linear. And so we have to apply a new auto STF. This is what my image looks like if I only see the very small scale variations. Well, I can see that there are stars and I can see that this is essentially noise because uh, this, uh, this image does not have a, a very high, very fine details. It's uh, the, the, snap, the nebula pictured in this image have a large scale, not small scale components. So I can start trying to reduce this noise. Let's say that I, for instance, I want to throw away anything which is uh, uh, less than one sigma from, uh, from, the, from the, the average. So let's see what it would look like. I set here noise reduction, one sigma. I drag and drop the icon. Ah, nice. There's still some, uh, I can st still see some uh, salt and pepper. So maybe I can increase it a little bit to 1.5 if I want. Uh, better. Maybe I can even afford to do in two. As I said, there's not much to lose here. There are not ma many details. So this is what I do for the first, uh, the first layer. When I'm happy, I move to the second layer. And again, I drag it. I, I make sure that no noise reduction is selected. I drag it and drop the icon. I do auto SDF. Pixel Insight is showing me what my image looks like at the scale of two pixels. And again, I'm doing the, the same trick. Well, let's start with the two, as we were saying. Is two sufficient? Mm, not really. I need uh, maybe three. three. Anything below three sigma is considered noisy? Mm, still not sufficient. I have to bump it maybe to four. Oh, wow. It's even more than four. Let's five, maybe? Yeah, five is not bad. There's still a little bit of salt and pepper, but I can probably try to address this by saying that I want uh, the, the adaptive behavior to start kicking in. So it's gonna take care of the outliers that are probably responsible for this uh, salt and pepper. Yes, much better. All right, I'm happy with layer two. Let's move on to layer three. So as you can see, it's an iterative process. You have to, um, Every image, unfortunately, is gonna have some differences. It's not a one size fit, fits all, but it is the way that if you want to, if you want to tailor the amount of noise reduction to your particular image, this is the way to do it, rather than having a very large impact that is the same for all images and then tweak the reducing the, the strength of this impact with masks. I am using a mask, but I'm using a basic, very basic mask. Nothing, those, uh, not one of those uh, uh, tweaked masks that require some level of uh, prediction in what uh, the tool will do that our, uh, that the journalist uses, for instance. I'm not saying that he's doing the, the wrong thing. He's doing the right thing because 
his his mo his modus operandi is geared towards that pro towards that process mine is slightly different so let's see scale three okay so scale three is still a, a good amount mostly noise um, maybe I would like to see what this part here looks at scale three. Let me do it. This is another preview on the same image. Now you see that now at scale three, there's something interesting. There are those uh, lines in the reflection nebula that start showing up. I want to preserve those. I don't want to throw them away. So let's see how much noise reduction I need to apply. So the previous layer was a five. Let's see four. Four is uh, maybe a little bit too aggressive. So let's go back to 3.5. And uh, there's lots of salt and pepper that comes out. So let's bring up the adaptive behavior. Better, I think, uh, I think it's what I, what I need here. So I move on to the next layer. Uh, this is the next layer. There's a, you can see here, I don't know if a zoom renders, but if you follow my mouse, this is the outline of the hand, the, the dark part. You don't see it as dark because here what you're seeing is the variations, not the absolute values. But it's uh, almost a filigree that you have to interpret in this image. So let's see how much I need to, how much nervous action is uh, suitable for this case at the scale of eight pixels. So the previous one was three and a 3.5. Let's start with 3.5 here. 3.5, drag and drop. Hmm, not bad, maybe even a little bit too much. Let's see three, what it, what it does. Start, start to have some salt and pepper. Uh, let's bring uh, in some adaptive. Okay, I like this. Uh, scale six. Uh, oh, before we move to scale six, uh, let me go back to my previous preview and see what it behaves here. It is important, and of course, it's a little bit slow and tedious to test these tools against multiple previews because you may have you have different levels of contrast and different uh, details in your image that you may want to preserve or you or uh, different uh, parts of the image are affected by different levels of noise so it seems to work even for this uh, for this preview so i'll move on to layer 5 what does the image look like at a scale of 16 pixels like this okay so there's this uh, details of the of the reflection nebula, and you can start seeing uh, pretty well the dark nebula, not just the, it starts to have a shadow. All right, let's see how much we need here. We use the three for the previous one. Let's uh, do less than three, like two and 2.5. And apply. Uh, still, uh, it's a little bit too much, too, still too noise left behind, let me increase it to 2.8 maybe. Now it's starting to get, uh, you have to strike a compromise between removing the noise and removing uh, the, the detail. You don't want to remove the detail as much as possible. So I'm, I keep on using the adaptive slider. We're almost done. <laughs> Okay, I like this. And uh, the last layer that I want to consider is layer six, uh, which corresponds to uh, the scale of 32 pixels. Let's see what the image looks like at this scale. Okay, it's almost unrecognizable. Uh, there's a, there is some variation. You see the, the difference between black and white. Let's see how much is needed, like, uh, I don't know, let's try again with 2.5 as we were doing before. 
Okay, 2.5 takes care of most of the noise uh, in this area, but still lets uh, this section here go through. What if I look at the other detail, the other preview was this, and after I apply noise reduction, yeah, yeah, this is the, the hand, you see the two fingers. Okay. Um, I am ready to apply the, the, the actual noise reduction. I'm gonna to apply to the preview first. So I switch this to no layer preview. And the last thing I want to do before uh, applying this is to scale, uh, to put a, you see that the strength, the S parameter is 1.0 maximum strength at all scales. I actually like to, uh, not to have this abrupt, uh, the everything is not used until uh, layer six, and then and then nothing. I like to start with S one point zero and go down to maybe amount uh, strength to zero point five by the time I'm at the, the the smallest layer, and everything scaled linearly in between. So zero point seven. 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and so on. Now I am ready to apply. I drag and drop. It's inside processes for a moment. It's slower than before because now it's doing all the, all the six layers at once instead of one by one as we were doing earlier. All right, auto STF. Wow, where's the noise? It's uh, before, after, before, after. And at least to my eye, I didn't throw away any detail. The, the reflection nebula here, all this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, structures, linear structures are preserved. I didn't, it did not invent uh, any detail here. Let's look at uh, how it works on the other area, the other preview. I have to do it again, of course, drag and drop. Four, five, six, and, and here, before, after, before, after. I think that I might have been a little bit too conservative at some intermediate scales. Like for instance, I see that there are some, uh, there's still some residual noise in this area. Maybe I could have uh, bumped this up to four maybe, and this one to three and a half, because those are the scale of four and eight pixels, which is still relatively small. Let's see. Yeah, better. Okay. When I'm happy, I can uh, drag and drop the process to the image as a whole. The mask is still uh, in force, as you can see by the color, the shading of the tab. And this is going to take a little bit because uh, now it's, it's no longer applying on the preview, but on the entire 4000 by 2700 pixel image. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting, uh, are there uh, any questions? I hope that this is not, uh, I know that there are much easier ways to do noise reduction and like uh, easy denoise. It's, the reason why I wanted to go through this is that these uh, coefficients are mostly considered black art. Um, I hope I'm showing that there's nothing black here. There's no black art. You, there is a way to properly gauge uh, how the, the effect of each of those parameters, it just needs a bit of patience. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. It's been a revelation. <laughs> Thank you. Now, my Pixel site is a little bit slow in this moment, so bear with me. 
I guess that asking to run Pix Insight uh, at the same time with Zoom was uh, a lot. Wow. All right, the first, uh, first channel is done. All right. Uh, note that um, it gets slower as the as the progresses uh, in the layers. This is actually it's because I use the I, I use the liberally the uh, adaptive a slider. If uh, by using that slider, you're basically forcing a um, insight to calculate a linear combination between uh, the the version of the image with uh, with no adaptation and uh, and one in which there is a, a local uh, um, local equalization applied before this um, before doing the noise reduction oper the, the MMT operation. When you do that, it gets slower and slower as the as the scale becomes larger. So if you if if it gets too slow for you, you reduce uh, the, the the adaptive slider to zero. You're gonna have to leave it with some salt and pepper, but it's faster. Or you just uh, just become more patient, <laughs> which I'm typically not. But it's uh, it's chugging through. My fear was that uh, PixInsight, uh, for some reason, uh, hogged the CPU and wasn't uh, progressing. But no, it's still working. So a little patience. And the to to give an overview of the things that we're gonna the, the following steps essentially. Uh, this is a. Uh, the last, uh, the last process that I like to apply in the linear, in the linear stage. From this point onwards, what I would do is, uh, given that this image has, uh, we want to extract very faint uh, nebula nebulosity from uh, from an image that has also some very bright stars. I don't want to saturate the stars. I want to preserve the star colors as much as possible. So I'm going to use a technique to separate uh, this image in a starless version and a star only version and process them separately. And this will lead us finally to the, um, to the, to the final image essentially after some processing and combination. Oh, it's done, thank, thank God. All right, now this is the denoised image. I'm, uh, I'm, I zoomed in uh, some more, I want to move uh, so that we can see here. And I'm gonna undo the denoising. This is undone and redo the denoising. Well, the efficacy of this tool to me is pretty impressive. I don't know if you share my view, but I'm happy. So at this point I can remove the mask and I, I'm ready to separate uh, this image into stars and nebula. So I know that we have uh, gone for about uh, one hour, 25 minutes. So um, shall we continue for a little bit? Uh, do you prefer me to, to stop uh, for questions or for uh, other, uh, other discussions? Hi, Glenn. Yeah, I was gonna, I was waiting for uh, other responses. I guess I'll give you my opinion, but I'm happy to be swayed. I'd say we go, you know, till uh, nine fifteen and then stop. Sounds uh, good. And uh, which is an hour forty five. We usually stop at an hour and a half, but I know we had a lot of attendees, a lot of interest. And and don't my recommendation is don't rush, don't skip you know we'll just pick up next time and you know get the full benefit of this, this yeah right yeah sounds good all right so 
I am going to close this uh, window and I'm going to iconize some of these windows so I can continue. So we are almost ready to stretch this image, to move it to the stretch version, the nonlinear space. But before I do that, as I said, I want to separate uh, the, the starless image from the stars. So that I I'm going to process them separately. And in this way, I am going as much as possible prevent the stars from becoming bloated and becoming all white, which is what happens when you stretch a star field in a naive way and uh, everything becomes white. So there are two ways, two steps to the, that I take to this. The first step is a script, which is very useful and it's called uh, repaired HSV separations. So this script, I, I started using it when I was uh, doing uh, mostly OSC with, uh, with my DSLR. The spectral response of the DSLR is not the same as, the, as an astro camera. And as a result, my, if, I, if I remove the auto STF and, and look at, at the stars in my image, right now they are uh, bluish. Can you see it here? There's a very, like a teal color in this image. Now, this doesn't mean that the stars are blue. What it means is that uh, some stars have saturated. Saturation means that the well in the pixel was full. And so the, the digital noise, the, sorry, the digital number that the, was readable downstream of the ADC was essentially one or six, 65,000. Uh, 536, which is the maximum value for in a 16-bit space. After calibrating the colors, what happened is that uh, PixInsight multiplied one channel or divided another channel for uh, some, some coefficient. And so what is completely saturated is no longer 1.0 in red, 1.0 in blue, 1.0 in green. It has become a, a, a different combination of these three values. In this particular case, I see that Saturation means that R is 0 0.7, green is 0 0.85, and blue is one. So it's bluish. This script, the H repair the state B separation, does a very useful operation. It tries to, to reconstruct the color of the saturated cores of the stars based on the color of the star halo. The assumption here is that the halo is not saturated, and the halo is a, is a faithful representation of the star color, reasonable assumptions. And uh, you're going to see the effect that it has. So it's very easy to use. You have to indicate uh, a two parameters, a repair level and a repair radius. A repair level means that uh, it's basically the saturation level. I'm going to tell the script that anything above 0.5 just don't consider the color there. Consider the color only of the parts that are below this threshold. And consider stars that have a maximum radius of 35 pixels. And don't clip the shadows. I don't want to never clip the shadows. <laughs> then I run the script. The script is going <clears> to <throat> chug for a while. And it's going to produce uh, three images that are three views uh, in, a, in a different color space, not in RGB but in the HSV color space. Once we have this uh, three, three results, I'm going to recombine. Now, these are the, the three the results. This is the SV component of this uh, space. This is the H component of the space. And this is the V component of the space. I think that this uh, S, H, and V corresponds to hue, so the, the color, the hue, saturation, and the value. Now, what I'm going to do, I want to, to use the tool called the channel combination, which is the, the same one that we have used to make an RGB image out of the three mono masters, but I'm going to set it to operate on the HSV space. And I'm going to use uh, the H version of this image as produced by the script as H, the SV image version of this image as produced by the script. And I am not gonna use uh, the V value. In other words, I'm gonna use whatever is the V value, the value 
sorry, the <coughs> pun and unintended, the V value for, for this image, I'm going to leave it unaltered. I'm only going to change the saturation and the hue, in other words. Look at what happens. Let me look at the, at the, at the preview. When I, happen, when I apply this, look at this preview here. You see how the color of the star changed? Let me, let me show you at, in, in a close up. This was the color of the star before the script. It was a bluish star. But if I look with the magnifier, the halo was not blue. The halo was orange. When I apply the script, this, uh, the combination, I have reconstructed the, the right color of the saturated core to be essentially uniform with, uh, the, with the halo. And this is extremely important. This is basically what brings color back to, a, to an image, to, to a saturated image. Once this is done, nothing has changed in the, <coughs> in the actual image. I can, uh, sorry, not in the actual image, in the way that I see the image after applying STF. I can close these three versions. And uh, what I'm going to do at this point is to, I need to create the starless and the star only version of this image. To my knowledge, there are different ways to do that. Uh, doing it in the linear space is co very convenient in my opinion, because that's what allows you to stretch the two uh, images separately. But uh, the, the most common ways to, way to do it, Starnet++, does not work on, a, on a linear images. So it would require some tweaking. You would need to do a pre-stretch, which does not saturate anything, then apply Starnet, uh, Starnet and then unstretch. Or there are scripts that do that automatically. I, I'm trying to remember how it's called, but I may not have it here installed, but there are people that have built a, a very useful tool to, to do Starnet in the linear domain. What I'm going to do here... Star Exterminator. Yeah, I'm going to use a Star Exterminator, which is not based on Starnet++, by the way. It's a different AI. But I, unfortunately, it's a little bit expensive. It's, I think it's $65, but I like it much more than Starnet because uh, it leaves behind very little uh, artifacts. There are some, still some artifacts, but they are easy to work with. So let me use uh, here Star Exterminator. And again, I'm not uh, giving them free advertising, but I like what they do. As you can see, as a, as a checkbox, you can tell, hey, this image is linear. So do what you need to do, but keep in mind that it's linear. And also going to ask it to generate a star image. So I don't, this is optional. You can always uh, operate uh, with a subtraction in pixel math to obtain the stars. But I prefer to ask the star exterminator to do it. So go star exterminator. And on my Mac, Star Exterminator is very slow, so I apologize. It's going to take a couple of minutes. On, because, just because my Mac doesn't have a, a discrete uh, um, GPU, it's using the Intel, the GPU inside the Intel i7 processor to do it. Modern Macs, needless to say, are much faster. And if you have a Windows machine with a nice, uh, with a nice GPU, it's going to fly through. But it's not too bad. As you can see, we are 25% in. And from, the, from this, this is step onwards. All I'm going to do is essentially going to be based on uh, the, the vision that I have in my head of how I want the final image to look like, because it's essentially everything is, is uh, dictated by by taste, by my, my aesthetic perception. Uh, as I said, this is not science. This is making pretty pictures. Fifty-five percent, so it's chugging along. But I hope you're going to be impressed as I as I was the first time I used the Starnet. If, if, sorry, I used the Star Exterminator. If you're familiar with Starnet plus plus, it leaves behind a strange texture underneath the larger stars, like this big uh, SU Cassiopeia here. Uh, Star Exterminator does an excellent job in creating a, a texture that matches the overall noise 
of your image. So it's almost invisible. On the flip side, it, it removes a part of the, some of the, especially when processing galaxies, small galaxies, I find that Star Exterminator has a little bit of a hard time telling a star from a, a, galactic, a galactic core. And so it requires some tweaking then, which I normally do in Photoshop to rebuild, reconstruct the, the, galactic, the, the galaxy cores. All right, this is the starless image, and these are the stars. Let's zoom in. I think it's pretty impressive. It's very smooth. And now we have uh, the stars here. We have uh, the nebula here. We can start stretching. And uh, to do the stretching at this point, I'll keep the stars for later. So I'm going to iconize them here. But here, I can be as naive as I want to with stretching. I can actually stretch with history and transformation instead of using sophisticated tools like uh, um, uh, arcs in H stretch or uh, mask stretch. I can just do here. And uh, go and uh, set the the foot of the curve. Stretch, stretch, stretch. You, I, I have enabled the, the real time preview. You can see the result of what I'm doing. Yeah, I can uh, I can stretch as much as I. Is uncomfortable with, as you can see, uh, maybe not. Yeah, I think uh, this should be more or less okay for an initial stretch. So I apply it. And now this is no longer a linear image. I just stretched it. So let me remove uh, all these previews that are just uh, confusing me in this moment. I want now. I want to do something to make this image more readable, to make the the helping hand more obvious. So the first thing I'm going to do. These are tools that I learned along the way. I use the exponential transformation using uh, the power on inverted pixels. Uh, this is a fancy name, but it's uh, for a very effective operator. Uh, I use this tool has an internal lightness mask which you can enable or disable it basically saves you the hassle of going and creating a mask let me show you in the preview what it does it does a very gentle or it can be gentle or hard depending on how how you, you tweak this parameter in this way it's relatively gentle this is the before and this is after it brings it out of the background if it's too much, you can always reduce this like this. And it's not bad. I'm happy. I apply it. Good. So now it's more visible. I would like to do something to make the contrasts even more, uh, more apparent. And uh, my tool of choice for this is usually the local histogram equalization tool. You can apply it with a mask. You can apply it without a mask. And you need to be, I mean, it, it takes a little judgment. If I apply it at the amount 1.0, let me show you what it looks like in uh, using the, the, the preview tool. Yeah, it creates, a, I would say, an unpleasant texture in the image. It's too much. But if you're not that aggressive and you scale it back to maybe 0.4, 40%, it's very nice. It creates, uh, oops, for some reason it disappeared. Give me, a, give me a second and I'll do it again. Okay. So it takes the image from here to here. It makes the edges more apparent. If it's still too much, it can be reduced. And it makes in general the image more, uh, more readable for what, for what we want. So let's try to do it uh, like 0 0.250. I apply it. It's not a very a very slow tool, but it takes a few seconds. It's not instant either. Okay, this is the result. Before, 
after, before, after, before, after. It, in, to my eye, this makes uh, the dark section of this nebula more prominent, not because it changes anything in the way they are uh, in their DNs, unlike what the other script uh, called the uh, uh, dark structure enhance does. What it does, it changes the surrounding parts. So it creates more micro contrast for, the, well, micro in the multiple quotes, because here we're talking about large scale structures in a way. So it's, uh, it's nice. Um, what I may want to do maybe is to increase uh, the saturation of the, of the colors. I use the color saturation tool, bring it up. And uh, yeah, I don't want to saturate it too much because then it becomes a technicolor image. Um, maybe I don't do it at all. I see a question, how do I get star exterminator? I don't see it in my version. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an add-on that you have to buy. It's not, a, it's not part of PixInsight itself. It's a, it's a product of, a, I can't remember the name of the guy, but it's an independent developer. It's not part of the PixInsight collaboration. So, and the, I don't know if you are familiar with this tool, the color saturation tool. It allows you to do some very interesting things. Like, let's say that I wanted to, give more saturation to this bluish reflection nebula. Well, and I don't want to saturate anything else. Well, you see that here there's a spectrum. These are the spectrum of, of the of colors. So I can build a curve just by clicking and creating points and then moving the points. This curve is going to give a lot of saturation to greens and blues. Maybe I don't really want the green. And almost nothing to the other colors. Let's see how it looks like once I apply it. Yeah, it's uh, subtle, but before, after, before, after. This section here is a, is a nicer color, to my eye at least. And we can continue a lot to do this, uh, we can continue uh, working on, uh, on, this, uh, on this image until uh, our aesthetic sense is pleased. But at some point, we're gonna have to bring back the stars. So what do we do with the stars? Well, the stars are the ones that require some attention here because these are unstretched stars. We still have to stretch them. And uh, I want to stretch them in a way that does not destroy them, that preserves their colors. So. The way I do this is with the ArcsNH stretch operator. That this ArcsNH stretch is great for stars. It preserves the color in an excellent way. If you apply to nebula, it, it tends to generally low contrast. So separating the nebula from the stars and applying different stretching strategies to each of the two, allows you to optimize the result for the nebula and for the stars. So what I, in this case, I am gonna use ArcsNH stretch. I'm enabling the real-time preview and uh, I am gonna stretch uh, like 150. This is an arbitrary strength number. It goes from, Z, from one to 1000. Um, I don't want to go too much because it, you see that start to it's really much in your, very much in your face. The stars become very saturated and the halos start coming out. I prefer to keep it at one, between 150 and one and 200. Let's say 150 in this moment. I am gonna apply it. And these are my stars. Now, how do I know if it's enough? Well, but I can do it by trial and error. So let's try to recombine the stars to this image, which is probably the last thing we're going to do before uh, before we can call it a night. The way I do it is with pixel math. I take pixel math, and I am going to use uh, an expression that I found on other websites on how to combine two images. And how to combine two images is to take the inverse of the two images multiply them by one another. So the, the, the tilde characters is, means invert this. 
in PixInsight. Dollar $t is uh, the target image. So I'm, gonna, I'm saying combine with the multiplication the inverse of the target image and the inverse of the stars, 0, 07 stars, and then do the inverse of the of the product. Uh, it may it, it, I'm sure I'm sure that it sounds abstruse right now, but look at the result. And the stars are back, and they have their colors, and they are they, are, they don't have any halos. I mean, dark halos around, and uh, sure, it can be perfected. I could sharpen the stars before doing this. I could use a different, uh, uh, a different amount of stretching, but the, just for a, a first attempt, it's not bad at all. At this point, I would uh, argue that this image looks too green, so I would apply some uh, SCNR uh, with a generous amount like 0 0.9 or 0 0.85 this gets rid of this uh, ugly green cast and uh, gets us to an image which is very similar to the one that i actually posted on astrobin if you can stretch more you can uh, you can uh, tweak more the uh, things like the exponential transformation that i used or uh, the local histogram equalization and uh, as I said, this is pretty pictures and it's not science. Once you are, if you are happy with the result, that's, that's what counts for us. Are any questions? <laughs> not, not that this image needs it, but if you wanted to uh, reduce the stars or base, eliminate the smallest stars, maybe yeah. what? When when would you do that and how? I would do it just before com just before doing this combination. I would go to the star only image. This only contains the star; it doesn't even need a star mask to operate. And uh, here I would uh, do some nice morphological transformation, like uh, a morphological selection using a structuring element, maybe five pixels wide. Uh, if I, if I zoom in, I would see the result. This has essentially reduced the smaller stars, you see, before, after, before, after. And then when I apply this, uh, when I recombine the stars with the starless version, I have uh, fewer stars or less visible stars. The stars are still there, but they are less apparent. Okay. This is also, it's a, in my opinion, doing it with the separated stars and starless is, a, is very powerful because you don't need masks, you don't need a tweak. It's much easier to, to tweak the result. Or you can just stretch less. That's also an option. <laughs> That was a great answer. That should be very handy. Um, are you tempted here to try a dark structure enhance? Sure, we can, uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, let's see what it looks like. I didn't use it on my, on my final image on Astrobin, but these are my default settings. It's about 40% uh, amount, so 0 0.4. One iteration only. Let's see what it looks like. Almost done. It's done. All right. So before, after, before, after. It's not very evident. And in my opinion, it makes uh, this uh, hand here, it seems to be making it a little bit uh, too dark to my taste. Instead of having this brown finger, sorry, it's uh, everything becomes a black. So I don't know if I would use it, but yeah, that's that. It's definitely a possibility. In my my experience, dark structure and answer works really well when there is actual structure with fine detail, with the broad, uh, large scale, uh, 
dark patches like this one without much uh, detail, it's not uh, it's not his best. Uh, it's not what it's most suitable for, in my opinion. Francesca, this is you know, a beautiful image um, and doesn't really need anything more. But I am wondering, uh, was it a time constraint that caused you to not use luminance, or uh, is it a particular type of target that you find you don't need to use luminance uh, rather than RGB only? Yeah, so the, I prefer to do RGB only. Uh, essentially, there are two reasons. One is uh, related to my equipment. I noticed that when I, although my refractor is uh, supposed to be an apochromatic refractor, it is uh, to some extent only, like uh, like all uh, like all real world refractors. And so when I do R, G, and B, I can optimize uh, the the focus the focus for each of the three colors. Whereas when I shoot luminous, I have to take a compromise. And as a result, I have larger stars than each of the R, G, and B images. This is one. The second one is that in general, um, an LRGB combination tends to uh, enhance the detail to the expense uh, of uh, color saturation. <clears throat> so, in an image that does not have much detail, fine detail like this one, I probably it's probably kind of pointless. I'm also following uh, some of the recommendation that uh, Juan Conejero has uh, gave over and over in his forums that if you want to do a large B, you are um, <clears throat> the the right way to do a large B is to do an unbind luminance and a bind RGB. And this is because uh, in this way, you can uh, shorten the time it takes to collect uh, R, G, and B by, by leveraging the fact that you have bin pixels. But if you are using uh, uh, unbind, uh, um, if you're using your camera unbind for each of the three primary colors and for luminance, you might just as well create a, um, a synthetic luminance in terms of uh, what is the signal to noise ratio that you're going to collect for a given allotted time. In this case, I had a given a lot of time because I only I was only at Pinagos for one night. I didn't have the luxury to go back. But isn't isn't that bending thing a, a CCD versus CMOS? So uh, what you're referring to it is uh, if you consider it uh, from the noise perspective. If you're considering it from the signal perspective, well, you're still uh, using pixels that have a. If you bend your camera your mono camera and the CMOS camera, you're still having uh, collecting uh, uh, photons from a larger area for each of the pixels that you're going to see on the on the computer screen. So yes, you're not going to have the noise read, the readout noise advantage that you're having with CCD, but the signal is the, if you're talking about the signal to noise where noise is uh, the, the Poisson noise associated with the photons, you still have an advantage. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, we probably should wrap up at a. You know, I am a done. Hour. <laughs> Give us a break. Thank you for your patience. That was amazing, uh, Francesco. And of course, we look forward to hearing you from you again, at least next month. So, <laughs> so uh, everybody. Uh, unmute and, and thank uh, Francesco and uh, then we'll we'll be off. Bravo. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Really, really liked it. Nice. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much. Right, thanks a lot. See everyone thank next Thank you very time. much. Yes, thank you. Bye. Thank you. You're a rock Bye. star. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. One only problem, now I have to redo all my images. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's just one way to do it. <laughs> All right, yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Take care. And thank you very much.